Welcome, fellow travelers. Welcome to all who have journeyed this path for a while. Welcome to those who are new to the path. Welcome to those who aren't sure where the path lies. Welcome to new visitors and to old friends. Welcome to the young at heart, to those of all ages and colors, all orientations and gender expressions, all abilities and cultures and opinions. Know that you are welcome here, no matter what, for this is God's house and all may enter here. Welcome to everyone. We hope that you find peace and uplift in our worship this morning. May God's love and light be with you all. The cries of injustice have reached God's ears and heart. God says, I see their oppression and suffering. We see it too, God. We respond, are you going to rescue them now? And God responds, so get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Who are we to fix injustice or bring your love into the world? I will help you, says God. I will be at your side must go. I have chosen you. Here we are, Lord. We will go. sea and sky. I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I am Oh. 
Exodus 3, 7-12 through 12. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land filled with milk and honey. A place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites just cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God in the mountain. But Moses said to the Lord, My Lord, I've never been able to speak well, not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you've been talking to your servant. I have a slow tongue and a thick tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives people the ability to speak? Who's responsible for making them unable to speak or hard of hearing or sighted or blind? Isn't it I, the Lord? Now go! I'll help you speak. I'll teach you what to say. But Moses said, please, my Lord, just send somebody else. Then the Lord got angry at Moses and said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak very well. He's on his way out to meet you now, and he's looking forward to seeing you. Speak to him and tell him what he's supposed to say. I'll help both of you speak, and I'll teach both of you what to do. Aaron will speak for you to the people. He'll be a spokesperson for you, and you will be like God for him. Take this shepherd's rod and w with you, too, so that you can do the signs. The salvation of the Hebrew people begins in relationship. The people cry out, God sees their suffering. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. Moses is called to act. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people home, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Of course, when we human beings are involved, it's never all that simple. Moses is not all that keen on going back to Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I don't blame Moses. It's not like he left Egypt on the best of terms. You may recall that the infant Moses was placed in a basket and sent floating down the river. While that may not be the first choice for quality infant care, it was necessary to save his life. Pharaoh had ordered that all the baby boys born to the enslaved Israelites be killed. Moses was then rescued from the water by Pharaoh's daughter, not knowing who he was. And then Moses was raised in the Egyptian royal household. Later, as an adult, Moses saw an enslaved Israelite being beaten by an Egyptian man. Moses killed the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. Later, he fled Egypt when the murder became common knowledge. So when God sees the oppression of God's people, and turns to Moses to act. Moses' reaction is understandable. But God is having none of it. 
When any risk is involved, we human beings, beings always seem to have an excuse for why we can't do as God calls us. Now go, says God. I'll help you speak, and I'll teach you what you should say. But Moses said, Please, my Lord, just send someone else. Then the Lord got angry at Moses. In the end, of course, Moses, equipped with his brother Aaron and a divinely powered shepherd's rod, returns to Egypt and tells Pharaoh, Let my people go. After multiple plagues, Pharaoh's stubbornness, and the parting of the Red Sea, Moses and the liberated people find themselves in the wilderness for 40 years. In my experience, most of life is spent in the wilderness. The times when I've felt that I've arrived in the promised land can be counted on one hand, maybe two or three fingers. I've also learned that whatever whatever promised lands I've struggled for, when I finally get there, I realize it never equals perfection or even my imaginings of what it would be like. At the end of 40 years, wandering in the desert, the Israelites finally entered the promised land without Moses and Aaron. Moses' and Aaron's calling was only to lead the people out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. True to form, while the Promised Land is an improvement over the wilderness, it's an imperfect place. This is the myth of normalcy. We buy into it as individuals, and we do this in the church too. Our unrealistic expectations lead us to unhappiness. We keep wanting things to get back to normal, to be perfect. But reality is always hard. Now, there are rare times when everything seems just right. For sure, there are moments of divine perfection every day. But life as a whole is hard. In the words of the great theologian Roseanne Rosanna Dana, it's always something. All that said, like our ancient siblings 3,500 plus years ago, we are in the very definition of the wilderness. We canceled in-person worship on that Friday afternoon in March, thinking that it would last for maybe a couple of weeks or, or a month at the most, we're now entering our sixth month, wandering the Corona Desert. Now, I don't know about you, but this pandemic has kind of lost any charm that it ever had. Like the Israelites wandering the desert for 40 years, we don't know when this will all end. As it drags on, we are not at our best. It's easy to lose our good natures. <laughs> I heard someone the other day describe Zoom as the spawn of Satan. Some days, I agree. Most days, I'm thankful that we have it. We crave predictability. And it's hard to have predictability in this pandemic. In that craving of predictability is often expressed in pretending Everything is normal and ignoring public health guidelines. Another way is that pre pretending can manifest is in being hard on ourselves and on others. This is hard stuff. It's taking a lot of energy. We don't know how to do this, even after the long five months that we've had. We are still trying to figure it all out. Isolation is not normal for humanity. Yet out of love of God and our neighbors, we must continue to wear masks, to social distance, to limit the number of contacts we have, to limit our germ pool, to limit our risk of connecting with others and passing something on or getting something. 
hand, we need to wash the skin off our hands, apparently. Like us, the Israelites quickly grew weary of the wilderness. They complained to Moses. They accused him of leading them out of, the, out of Egypt just to starve in the desert. You've brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death, they said. You should have just left us in Egypt to die. We begin our journey through the wilderness with Moses and the formerly enslaved Israelites today. It's no mistake that we begin with the calling of Moses. It's also no mistake that once again, when in great, great injustice needs rectifying, that God turns to an imperfect human being. That is the way of God, to use imperfect human beings. God doesn't intervene directly. Instead, God lures and encourages. God pushes and canoodles. And in the case of Moses, firmly insists that he do the work of liberating the enslaved in Egypt. We all have a calling. We all have callings, really, because our callings change over time. God's, God, did not just cre God didn't just create us. God continues to transform us when we're open and willing to heed the lures and urgings of the divine, loving energy. Sometimes our calling is big and dramatic. Moses had a burning bush after all. Mystics and clerics often have stories of divine encounters. But it's not just doctors and teachers and clergy who are called by God. So are grocery clerks, mechanics, homemakers, the unhoused, and garbage collectors. To paraphrase the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, there is dignity in all callings. Even if you have a dramatic calling, you will also have small and simple callings. Maybe your calling is to, to take that dish you prepare for a neighbor when they're going through tough times. Maybe you're called to remind your friends how to live safely during the pandemic. Maybe you're called to laugh with friends on the telephone or give virtual FaceTime hugs to grandchildren across the continent. Often, your calling requires you to stretch, to do something more than you feel equipped to handle. We may be tempted to speak as Moses speaks. Please, my Lord, just send someone else. But if God can use a murderer to make this world more just, God can use you too. And the good news is that God will equip you like God did with Moses. God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. Our callings are frequently things that we feel ill-equipped to handle. But if we trust in God, if we take that risk, if we're doing the good and being love, we will never be alone. Life is about relationship, even when we can't hug or shake hands or be within six feet of one another. In this COVID wilderness, our pain of being apart is real. We hurt because we're built to be together. But God needs us to stay connected while following health guidelines, even though it's hard, even when we're ill-prepared, even when it seems we've already been in the wilderness for 40 years. We will survive this time in the Corona Desert if we stay focused on the Kingdom of God. We will be tempted to gather up more manna than we need. It's hard to trust that God will provide enough for today and then tomorrow there will be enough again. We may even be tempted to create and worship golden calves. As we continue our existence in the wilderness, answer your call for this time, assured that when you do, God will equip you and see you through to the promised land. 
imperfect as it will be. Amen. Please join me at Christ's table for his gift of inviting us to share in this sacred symbol. Gifts are a wonderful thing to give and to receive. A couple weeks ago, a good friend knocked at my door. She had for me, to match my little picture that I've been using for communion, she had a beautiful pottery cup and plate. She had found it at the coast, and she knew that I just needed it to go with my picture when I do communion. How kind and how thoughtful. How did she know that I often search around for just the right cup, and now I have a plate too? She knew what I needed. Christ's breaking of the bread and taking of the wine on the night before he died. Did he know that we would need and use this beloved meal to remind us that his love and his grace is with us always? It truly has been a holy gift from him to us. His words, as often as you do this, remember me, makes me think that he knew what we would need. And as another gift today, I've asked Denise to sing our communion hymn. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Oh, when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun. Praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together. After taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and said, This cup is a new covenant by my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we pray, praise you for what you have given us and for what you have promised us here. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you and we ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom. And that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of this troubled, troubled world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take and eat, and remember that all are welcome at this table.
Go now and be the people God calls you to be. Take those risks. Be assured that just like Moses, even if you don't want to go, God will be with you. God will equip you. Corona land will not last forever. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.